welcome back to a new edition of EKG. Derek likes to call you guys his young Padawans. I don't think he really knows the power of the dark side. So we're gonna go down the dark side of the path with our EKG. I've given you a little bit of intro and today we're gonna talk about the next level of walking down this path uh, as we start to discuss how to analyze an EKG. All right, so let me share a screen and we'll start discussing some of this. <clears throat> so analyzing an EKG. I'm going to start off by giving you an approach to this and I'm gonna fully admit that I'm going to alter the approach a little bit later as we start to gather more EKG information and we start to expand what we're doing. But right now what we're gonna talk about is how to analyze a single strip EKG, which is the start of kind of everything that, that, we, need to, that we need to do. Uh, so um, I'm gonna tell you that I'm not gonna cover the first few slides that I have here. I've put them up as review. So I'm gonna flip through them really quickly uh, and you can take your time on them. I just put them there as a review, but really it's just an animation that kind of goes through and uh, kind of discusses the cycles of where an EKG is and what it is doing in the heart. So you can take the time to look at that on your own. Uh, it isn't really about analyzing EKG, but it's a place to kind of start. So. What I want to start talking about is how to look at a basic rhythm and identify it. Uh, and I really will want you guys to approach every single EKG in this manner. So we're going to give you uh, an EKG uh, workbook, so to speak, that's going to have literally hundreds of strips in that. You'll get that here uh, in the coming weeks. And it'll have tons and tons and tons of EKGs. You can't do enough analyzing of EKGs uh, throughout the course of this year. And you want to start pretty quickly as you're starting to study this material. So you'll have a whole bunch of single strips and you'll have a whole bunch of 12 leads that are included in them. And I want you to start approaching every single one of them in this manner. And the changes that I'll make as we go through EKG will simply be that I'm going to expand the, the different steps that we have. So uh, to start everything off, uh, you have to have a systematic process and a systematic approach to every single EKG. If you don't, you're gonna get lost. Uh, if, you, if you walk into an EKG that is out of sight or weird or strange in some fashion, um, it can get overwhelming to try to figure out what it is but if you always have a systematic approach, uh, it'll come out in the wash almost every single time. So uh, let me walk through each of the steps. Then I'll go into each of the steps in more detail, cover a couple of things at the end that are just uh, random bits of information about uh, EKGs. And then we'll get into the first set of strips uh, from sinus rhythms. So first thing that we do when we start looking at an EKG strip is I want you to eliminate the crap. Yes, that's a technical term, EKG crap. I want you to look at the EKG, find out if there's anything on the EKG that doesn't look like everything else. So let me define what I mean by crap. Crap doesn't necessarily mean something that looks bizarre. The whole strip might end up looking bizarre to you. Look for pieces of the EKG that look out of place compared to everything else within that EKG and eliminate it, cover it up, pretend it's not there. Pretend that normal stuff, normal for that EKG is in its place. Then you're gonna determine the rhythm and we'll talk about what that means. You're going to establish and calculate the rate. And yes, you're gonna be doing this by hand to figure out the rate, not just looking at the machine. You'll establish and identify what the P waves are. You'll measure the PR interval. You'll measure the QRS complex. Then you will re-identify the crap. So these will be the general steps that will follow for every single EKG that you approach. 
with the added caveat that as we go through more and more EKGs, I will kind of add steps or sub steps to, to this general outline. So first thing that you wanna do, eliminate the crap. Pretend there are no problems with a particular strip and identify, uh, identifying the crap will all happen towards the end. So in this particular case, if you're looking at this strip, you look at it and you see there are two areas that look different than everything else. So this QS complex and this QS complex and the P waves associated with them and the T waves associated with them all look normal all the way through compared to each other. But this looks different and this looks different. So the second and eighth uh, complexes, even though they look the same with each other, look different than everything else. So you will cover up the second and you will cover up the eighth complexes uh, and I'm sorry, seventh complex, the second complex and seventh complex. You will cover up those two complexes and then just pretend that one of these normal cycles is in its place for the time being. That's perfectly fine. You'll I identify the underlying rhythm based on the normality of this complex uh, of, of this strip without the this this abnormal stuff in place. So eliminate the crap. After you've done that, then you want to identify what the rhythm is. When we talk about the rhythm, there's a couple of things we're looking at. One, generally speaking, is it fast or is it slow? Yes, I know that sounds like rate, but it's actually part of the rhythm. So is it generally speaking fast or slow? Um, bradycardia would be something under 60, tachycardia is something over 100, but is it generally fast or slow? And then is it regular or irregular? Does it have a regular rhythm to it? Does it have an irregular rhythm to it? And then if it's irregular, you have to go one step further and decide if it's what we call regularly irregular, which means it has some pattern to it, or is it irregularly irregular so that it has no pattern at all to it? So there are three options, three options when it comes to rhythm. It's either regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular. And each of those carries with it a different set of considerations that you're going to make. So when you're looking at the rhythm to find out if it's regular, look at the P to P intervals. That's from one P to the next P, from one P wave to the next P wave, and see if all of the P to P intervals are the same. So you take your calipers, you set your calipers on the first two P waves, and then you twist them from one P wave to the next. And if you don't have to change the size of your calipers, to make, to make it to the next P wave all the way through, then you have regular P to P, a regular P to P interval. Then you're gonna take a look at the R to R intervals. You're gonna do the exact same thing. And in fact, you actually should be able to take the calipers you just used from your P to P interval check and just move it straight to the R to R and it should be the same. If it's the same, then you're doing the same thing looking at all the R to R intervals and they should all be the same. So if the P to P intervals all match the other P to P intervals, and if the R to R intervals all match the R to R intervals, and if the P to P interval matches the R to R interval, then you have a regular rhythm. And that's easily done with the use of your calipers. If it's anything outside of that, then it is irregular. And then you're gonna to start to determine if there's a pattern to that irregularity or if it's completely irregular and has no pattern associated with it at all. So rhythms are regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular. And all, all of your uh, strip analysis that you're gonna turn into us, when it comes to rhythm, this is what we're asking you. We're asking you, are the rhythms regular? regularly irregular or irregularly irregular. So in a regular rhythm, 
the, the rhythm is constant and steady. Uh, if we call something, for example, a normal sinus rhythm, then it is in fact a regular rhythm. Otherwise it would not be a normal sinus rhythm. It would be something else. We'll discuss that when we talk about sinus rhythms. So in this case, you see that all the R to R intervals match all the way through and they should also match all of the P to P intervals. Regularly irregular rhythms are ones that have some sort of a pattern to them. There's a reoccurring pattern. So in that first example, you see uh, the, the, the things you see here, the gold bars are supposed to be cardiac cycles, or you could just pretend that they're QRS complexes. The blue dots are something else, like a missing QRS complex would be perfectly fine. So this one has four QRS complexes and then a missing complex, and then four QRS complexes and then a missing complex, and then presumably four more and then a missing complex. So what this is telling you is that its pattern is a four to one pattern of some sort. Example two is a two to one pattern. Example three is a one to one pattern. Um, all of those patterns have some sort of a, of a uh, the, or all of those uh, examples have some sort of a pattern to them. Same thing down here with example four. Uh, if, we if we pull this out, this is a, there's five complexes, then a missing complex, then four, and then a missing complex, then presumably three and a missing complex, then two and a missing complex, then one and a missing complex, and then it might start over back at five again. Whatever the case is, those are showing you a pattern. And that pattern tells you that it is, it's irregular because if we were to caliper this out, our calipers would caliper out up here on these first uh, four complexes. But right here, there's nothing there anymore. So from the fourth complex to the fifth complex, the fourth gold complex to the fifth gold complex in example one, as you see here, uh, the calipers would not be the same size. So it is irregular, but it's still following a pattern. So look for patterns. Um, then on, on an irregularly irregular rhythm, this is one there it's, where it's completely chaotic. So the strip you're actually looking at is down here, the, what we call the final strip. And there's many different ways that this can come up with. But down here, all of these box, all of these rectangles down at the bottom are QS complexes. So if you caliper them out from the gold to the green is one size, then from the green to the gold is a different size, then gold to gold is a different size, then gold to green, then green to blue, then blue to gold. All of those are different sizes. Therefore, our calipers are constantly having to move in and out. Um, there's many different ways that that can come with it. it Maybe it's a composite of different pacemakers. They're all trying to control the heart at the same time. In this example, there are three different pacemakers that are trying to control the heart. Um, and how, how this would happen is go back and remember your AMP. Uh, I know that you're gonna hear that lots and lots in this class, but you gotta know your AMP, right? So if you go back to your AMP and remember depolarization and repolarization, you'll recall that uh, after depolarization and while you're going through repolarization, there comes a time where you have absolute refractory periods and relative refractory periods. During absolute refractory periods, no, nothing more can happen to stimulate cells. During relative, re, um, during relative refractory this example is this pacemaker B fired first. However, um, pace, the rest of the cells, the contractile cells, were, have just responded to pacemaker B. And so they were in their refractory period, their, their absolute refractory period when pacemaker A fired. And because of that, they didn't respond. But by the time pacemaker C fired, those contractile cells were either in their relative refractory period or they were completely done with repolarization. So they could then fire again. So that's why green happened. Then when green happened, pacemaker B fired, but the, the contractile cells were in their refractory period, so they didn't respond. The next thing that happened was the, goal, the pacemaker B fired again, 
and the cells were ready to fire at that time. And you can play that through all the way across to see when cells are going to fire. Here we had the green one fire, but by the time pacemaker B fired again, the contractile cells were refractory, so they couldn't respond, but they were done being refractory by the time pacemaker A fired. And you can see how the composite can, uh, can be produced, but also it's producing a completely irregular pattern that has no, an ir completely irregular rhythm that has no pattern to it. And that's how we get an irregularly irregular rhythm, or one of the ways that we can get an irregularly irregular rhythm. Uh, next, we start to obtain the rate. Um, the rate can be found in a lot of ways. You can use the ruler method for which we are not gonna use in class, meaning I think I mentioned before when I talked about uh, the different tools that there are rulers that have certain information on them that help to make things easy for your analysis. Um, that's fine to use when you're um, out in the field, um, but for right now, you're going to learn how to calculate everything by hand, and then you'll understand how everything works when you have the tools to make it easier later on. Um, we can use the ECG, the ECG and its basic knowledge of time intervals. We'll discuss that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the computerized interpretation that the, e um, that the EKG will give you itself. Uh, however, uh, anytime an EKG machine is is pouring out a, a rhythm or pouring out a rate that doesn't seem reasonable, you have to be able to calculate it yourself. And we're gonna, we're gonna be calculating everything ourselves as we look at these strips. So there's a few methods that you can use. One method is called the triplicate method. The triplicate method is just memorizing uh, the different numbers associated with rate, uh, like you're memorizing a phone number. It's actually mathematically correct, and I'll show you how you get that. But um, basically what you're doing is you are finding a QRS complex that falls on one of the thick lines. This is just to make it easy. And then what happens is if a QRS complex falls on the next big line, then you'd have a rate of 300. If it fell on the second big line after the QRS complex you're starting with, then it would have a rate of 150. If it falls on the third line, it would be 100. The fourth line would be 75, the fifth line would be 60, and so on. And your numbers would be 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 43, 38, 33, 30. Um, so you would just memorize that those numbers. Yeah, I know that that might seem daunting, but actually when you do it hundreds of times, it, it becomes kind of second nature. Then if you have a complex like this that falls in between two, you have to kind of guesstimate or um, understand appropriately what that might be. So right here, we're looking at a rhythm of somewhere around 65 beats per minute. Um, so that's one way that you can do it. Uh, that's the, in terms of starting it. You can also uh, use calipers and caliper, get the size of these two QS complexes. So set your calipers for the R to R interval and then move that to another area of the EKG so that you can put a caliper right on a, a dark line. Uh, and that's for a rhythm where none of the QS complexes actually line up on, on one, of those, uh, one of those lines. So that's one way that you can do this, okay? Um, as I just said right here. Um, advantage of using your calipers is just, you don't have to try to hunt for any of the QS complexes that fall on a, on a pink line. Um, and once you get good at it, you'll start to understand how you can do it uh, very, very quickly, uh, even if it's not on a big line and you're not using your calipers. Other methods, you can use the six second method. The six second method works really well for uh, very regular rhythms. Uh, this is a, a, a way of using the time intervals that are associated uh, with it as well. But what you're doing is you're counting the complexes. Um, as you're counting the, the complexes, uh, most of the EKGs that you have will print out with hash marks. So you see that this EKG down here at the bottom has these three hash marks. The EKG up here has a bunch of hash marks. So there's a difference in how those, those work. Typically, an EKG will hash mark out every three seconds. Um, this one right here is hash marking every second but it, then it has hash marks that are larger on the three second intervals. 
Um, some of them like this one down here only hash out three seconds. Um, and that tells you, so, so basically it's a way that you can find a six second strip in, in an easy manner. So what you're doing is you're counting the number of complexes in a six second strip typically. Uh, so here, right here, you see that this starts on the P wave. So I'm counting from one P wave to the next. So there's one, two, three, four. So there's four of them in three seconds, five, six, seven, and this one should go all the way out. There's eight. So a little over eight complexes. So a little over 80 beats per minute in a six second strip, um, eight strips, six, a six second strip would go into a minute 10 times. So you multiply the number of cardiac cycles that you came up with by 10. And that gives you a rough rate. This is a rough rate though, and it will be a little bit off. Um, but that's one way that you can do it. The other thing you can do is you can count the number of boxes between QRS complexes. If you count the number of large boxes, you can divide the, divide the number of boxes into 300, and that'll give you a rate. Or you can divide the number of small boxes, and that'll give you a rate as well. Remember that we talked before, uh, when the paper goes through the pen, it's going at 1 25th of a second, or 0 0.04 seconds per little box, or 0 0.2 seconds for every big box, right? So if there, if you look at the big boxes, if, it, if it's 0 0.2 seconds per big box, then you have 300 boxes in one minute. So you can divide the number of big boxes into 300 to give you seconds. So for example, if I had uh, a rate where I had a QS complex on one line and my QS complex was on the very next line, then I would have one big box. I would divide one into 300 and my rate would be 300. If it was two boxes, if my QS complex was on one line and my next QS complex was two lines later of the big blinds, then I would divide two into 300 and my rate would be 150. You'll note that if you remember back to the triplicate method I talked about, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, you'll see that that math is done for you as well. Um, if I'm counting the little boxes, uh, then in the same vein, if I went from one big line to the next big line, that would be five little boxes. Five divided into 1,500 is 300. So I can count the, the number of boxes and I can divide it that way as well. So those are a number of different ways that I can establish rate and we'll practice them all. The next thing that we do is we check the P waves, uh, which let me, let me pause just for a minute and say, all of this we will go over many, many times and you'll have lots of practice with all of these different things. Um, I will sneak into one of the labs at some point in time where we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions and we'll do some demonstrations and stuff as well on EKG. Uh, so the next thing is P waves. First of all, do you see any P waves? Um, P waves are the things that talk about atrial depolarization. It lets you know that there is supraventricular activity that's going on, so things that are above the ventricles. So do you see any P waves? If you do, are they all identical? If they're all identical, then it means they're coming from the same pacemaker site. Uh, so note what those are. Look at the PR intervals. Are the PR intervals all the same? Now, I, you, we're going to be specific about the PR interval in just a minute. So right now, you're just looking to see that they're the same. And it's actually a check of P waves, not the PR interval. Um, are all the P waves identical with all PR intervals the same? Uh, that's what you're trying to establish. Uh, if the P waves are not identical, then either you have more than one pacemaker uh, set of cells that are firing or you have something else happening with the EKG at the same time and it's superimposed on top of the P wave. Then you're looking to see that every QS complex has a P wave. This is still the P wave check, but you're looking that every QS complex is associated with a P wave. Uh, if you have an abnormal number of P waves 
compared to QRS complexes, then it means there's some sort of a block in the system. And we, you'll learn how to analyze all of those. And then you're looking at the morphology. Is it in the correct position for the, the lead that you're looking in? In leads two, three, and AVF, the P wave should be upright. In V1, the P wave should be, uh, should be negative. It should be inverted. Um, so you're looking at, at all of the, the P waves and are they in the right position for the lead that you're looking at? The leads two, three, and F, they're upright. V1, they're upside down. Other leads, they might be either upright or upside down, depending on the axis. Uh, okay, then we look at the PR interval. You already established if it was constant when we were looking at the P wave, but you're making sure that it's constant here and then you're timing it. Remember uh, when we first talked about PR intervals, I mentioned that you wanted to memorize the time. This is when it comes into play. So the PR interval should be from 0.12 to 0.20 seconds or three to five little boxes. If it's smaller than 0.12, if it's less than 0.12, then it means the pacemaker site is not the SA node and that the pacemaker is now somewhere else in the atria or in the junction itself. Or it could mean that there's some sort of a bypass track someplace between the atria and the ventricles that is not going, that is not allowing the delay that's supposed to happen with the AV node. If the PR interval is greater than 0.20, then it means we've got some sort of a, a block in the AV node. You can have some variations in the morphology uh, and variations in PR intervals based on where the pacemaker actually is. Um, so depending on whether or not we've got a singular pacemaker site or something, you might have some slight variations in the size and morphology of the P wave and the PR interval. We'll start uh, talking about and figuring out exactly where that margin of error is to determine if it's what we call a normal PR interval or if there's uh, or if it's slightly off. And so we'll discuss that as we go. Something that people don't often understand, and I wanna make sure this is really clear. I mentioned this before, but I, I wanna make sure this is really clear. This is kind of a cartoon that shows you what happens in the PR interval. Before the P wave, before the P wave, the SA node fires. We will not see any autorhythmic cell activity on an EKG. There's not enough autorhythmic cells to show up on the EKG. What shows up on the EKG are the contractile cell depolarization. What that means is that the P wave is talking about the atrial contractile cell depolarization. We don't see the SA node, but the SA node fires just a fraction of a millisecond before the P wave. Then it starts to go through the contractile cells and they start to depolarize. Simultaneous to that, the signal also reaches, or just slightly after that, it reaches the AV node. In the AV node, it starts the delay process. So the signal is trying to get through the AV node, but the AV node has its convoluted pathways that makes it nice and slow so that the atria can finish its contractile cell depolarization and subsequent, hopefully, contraction. The AV node is still holding on to that signal for a little bit longer after the atrial cells should be done depolarizing. Then the signal is sent through the bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers before it reaches the QRS complex. The QRS complex is a representation of ventricular contractile cell depolarization. That means that all other cells have depolarized before we ever, before it ever, the signal ever reaches the ventricles, okay? So the PR interval includes the SA node firing, the atrial depolarization, the contractile cells firing, the AV node, the bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers all fire during the PR interval. And then the QRS complex is the actual contractile cells of the ventricles. Um, that's a little bit uh, odd for, for some people because they, they don't realize how much actually happens in the PR interval. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. Then we get to the QRS complexes. In the QRS complexes, uh, we want to know that uh, 
we have P waves and QS complexes associated with one another. Yes, you check this in the P wave. You're reviewing this or um, confirming this with the QS complexes as well. You want to make sure that the P waves and QSs are associated with each other. Then you're looking at the entire QS complex and deciding if it's a normal beat, if it's coming early, which we call premature, or if it's coming late, which we call an escape beat or some sort of a, of a nodal block. All of that will be defined as we look at different rhythm strips. Um, and then you're looking at whether the, the QS complexes are what we refer to as narrow or wide. So you recall that the QRS complex should be less than or equal to 0.11. So we want to know if it's narrow or wide. If it's less than 0.11, then we say that it's narrow. If it is 0.12 or greater, then we would say it is wide. Um, narrow indicates that the impulse initial, uh, was initially found in supraventricular rhythms. That would be sinus, atrial, or junctional. That means we have a pacemaker site somewhere above the ventricles. That's a good thing. If it's a wide complex, then it means that the depolarization in the ventricles is going cell to cell. That means outside of the Purkinje system. Uh, that means either we have a block someplace that's causing it to go cell to cell or the original pacemaker is in the ventricles itself. Then we wanna know if there's any grouping of the QS complexes. So if, you, if we go back to when we talked about rhythm and some of them were patterned, uh, so maybe we had four complexes and then a dropped complex and then four and then dropped, we want to know if they're grouped. If they're grouped, what is that grouping? So is it three complexes and then something different, three complexes and then something different? Uh, are there recurring premature complexes that are coming in some sort of a pattern? Whatever the case is, you want to identify if there's any sort of grouping process with the QRS complexes. Again, that'll be made clear as we move through this stuff. And you want to identify if there's any dropped beats. Dropped beats will be caused by AV nodal blocks it can be caused by sinus blocks and arrests, which we'll talk about in another, in another video. Uh, it can be caused by a non-conducted PAC. There's a number of things that can cause a dropped QRS complex. And so you just need to note if there are any dropped complexes. Look and make sure, do the P waves and QRS complexes follow a particular pattern? Uh, meaning, are there the same intervals that separate them? or the intervals different between some or all of the beats. Uh, and again, that's going to tell you whether or not we are grouping things or if the patterns uh, are inappropriate or if the QS complexes and P waves are not associated with each other. OK, so before I move forward, I'm going to make a statement that will become clear in future weeks. But you kind of think of us as, only, uh, as people as only having a single heart. I want you to start thinking of the heart in, as multiple organs. We have a left heart and a right heart. The right heart sends blood through the pulmonary system. The left heart sends blood through the systemic system. We also have a, a superior heart and an inferior heart. The superior heart being the atria and the inferior heart being the ventricles. I want you to start thinking about the heart as multiple organs. So as it pertains to superior and inferior, you've got the P wave that is coming from atrial depolarization, and you have the QRS complex that is coming from ventricular depolarization. And the reality is those two can, come, can start to initiate their very own strips. You might have a strip of atrial depolarization and a strip of QRS depolarization that is not associated with each other. The P waves, should be causing the QRS waves, but in some strips, they do not. Uh, and that's gonna be a notable thing for your patient as well. It's possible for you to have what's called artifact in the strip, and you need to start being able to recognize how to tell if something is artifact versus part of what the heart is doing. Things that can cause artifact would be bumping of the patient, uh, tremors or shivering, um, 60 cycle engine from the ambulance, uh, any other vibrations that are that are around the patient could all be placing artifact into the into the system. So here we would note that that you see the the this, these squiggles here are artifact. 
You can tell that they're artifact though, because if you look at the rhythm, if you remember rule number one, which is to eliminate the crap, if we were to eliminate the, the, these squiggles and pretend that we had something normal there, you'd see that if we calipered out these QRS complexes, they are all still palling along like they're supposed to, which means if this QRS complex is happening in the same timing as these other QRS complexes, then that means the thing that caused this QRS complex has to be the same thing that caused this QRS complex, which means this P wave caused this QRS complex. That means there has to be a P wave just before this complex. Uh, and therefore, because it's all regular all the way through, you can tell that the squiggles here are artifact and not something that is coming from the heart itself. So you're gonna have to start using the, the resources around you within the EKG to really tell if something is artifact or if something's coming from the heart itself. Um, note premature complexes. So what we see here, the, the blue lines that you see here on the bottom are pretend that those are calipers and the uh, goldenrod colors, these, these gold colors, those are QRS complexes. So we're calipering out the QRS complexes. And then we find that over here on the one, two, three, four, five, sixth complex, it didn't come when it was supposed to, it came early. And because it came early, we call it a premature complex. That premature complex could have happened because the SA node fired early for some reason. It could happen because the atrial tissue fired something off early, the AV node fired off early, or even the ventricles themselves fired off early. If we have premature complexes, they can be independent and isolated, or they can come in some sort of a pattern. If they come in a pattern, we actually name them. So in this case, the red complexes are the complexes that are coming in early. So the QRS complex here, the black one is normal. Um, it's supposed to be right here, but it, it came early where this red one is. So it came early. If you have an early complex, every other QRS complex, so we had normal, black, then we had premature red, then normal black, then premature red, normal black, premature red. If it's every other complex, then we call it a bigeminal premature complex. So we say we have a bigeminy of complexes. It happens every other QRS complexes. If it happens every third, then we call it trigeminy. If it happens every fourth, then we call, call it quadrigeminy. And that's pretty much as high as we go. Bigeminy, trigeminy, and quadrigeminy. And if it's more than that, um, then we would call it variable <clears throat> or infrequent or frequent, depending on how it's coming. So we'll define that as we go. If I have a complex that comes late, that can also come from um, sinal node tissues, atrial tissues, AV tissue, or, or ventricular tissue. But if I have a complex here, what I have is I've got these, these first three black complexes are normal. And if I caliper those out, I should have one that comes in right about here, but nothing comes in there. And instead this red complex comes late. That means that this late one, we would call an escape complex. If that initiated a whole new rhythm, then we would call the new rhythm an escape rhythm. So that's an escape complex. So if a, if a QRS complex comes early, we call it premature. If it comes late, we call it an escape complex. Um, the four areas that create rhythms, and we're gonna talk about each of these areas and, and, and start discussing the different rhythm strips or the different rhythm analyses that come from each of these strips are these areas, but these, these arrhythmogenic zones are the sinus, the sinus node, the atria itself, the AV node and bundle of hiss, which we refer to as the junction, and the ventricles. So we name our rhythms based on one of those four areas. So we're gonna cover four areas of single strip rhythms, sinus rhythms, atrial rhythms, junctional rhythms, and ventricular rhythms. Um, so you, we're gonna break everything down into those four zones. Um, we'll talk about ectopic foci and the morphology that comes from that. Anytime we use the word ectopic, we mean it's coming from a place that it's not supposed to. Think ectopic pregnancy, right? An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy where typically the fetus is growing in the, in the 
uterine tube rather than in the ovary. Um, then it's, it's called ectopic pregnancy because the, the fetus is out of place. It's not where it's supposed to be. So an ectopic foci, a foci is a focus, a place where a pacemaking uh, area is initiated. An ectopic focus is a focus that is happening outside of where it's supposed to. It's supposed to be in the SA node. If it's in a different place than the SA node, then we call it an ectopic foci. And there'll be morphology associated with that. So here um, you see in this top left, uh, if the SA node is working, we would see, look, just look at the P wave for right now. If we, if we had the SA node working, we'd have this nice upright uh, normal P wave. But over here, this blue star, if the blue star was the focus, the ectopic focus, then the signal would be going in the opposite direction. And that would give us a flipped P wave, okay? If it was coming from the junction in the AV node, perhaps we wouldn't have any P wave at all. Uh, so depending on where the focus is, it would change the way that our, uh, the morphology of our EKG would be. Here on this yellow star, if it's the place that the focus is starting, Note that we have a difference in the shape of the QRS complex. It's wider. Over here with this blue star, maybe it gives a completely different shape of the QRS complex. Anyway, around it, uh, if, they, if we have an ectopic focus, it's going to change the different morphologies of our waves as well. And you'll start to learn how to look at an EKG, see a certain morphology, and then make an educated guess as to what the ectopic focus is. Um, again, P wave morphology is based on the where the the where the pacemaking site is initiated from. Uh, so P waves can be upright or they can be inverted. Um, junctional morphology could be a number of different things. You might have a um, inverted P wave tucked up against the QRS complex. You might have what we call a retrograde P wave, which means the P wave comes after the QRS complex or you might have a P wave that's hidden inside the QRS complex altogether. And I'll discuss that more when I talk about junctional rhythms. So the P wave might be before, it might be before, it might be at, uh, during, it might come after even. Ventricular complexes, once again, will give you really bizarre looking QRS complexes. Uh, and you'll just have to start to identify what is the QRS complex or not. So here we have, the QS complex is here, and this is the T wave. Here we have the QS complex here, and this is the T wave. Here we have the QS complex here, and here's our T wave. So you'll see uh, different looking QS complexes with ventricular rhythms um, that create weird morphologies. And that just has to do with where it initiates. And then as it travels cell to cell to cell, uh, it tells us. Uh, it tells us that the, the autorhythmic cells, the Purkinje fibers are not functioning properly. Uh, and aberrancy, when we say a rhythm has an aberrancy in it, we're saying that there's a block someplace that is forcing the signal to go cell to cell. So for example, a bundle branch block is a form of an aberrancy. It means that as the signal is traveling down the autorhythmic cells, it gets to a place where it can no longer travel the autorhythmic cells. And now it's starting to travel cell to cell which widens out and makes the QRS complex somewhat bizarre looking. Um, and then when we talk about fusion beats, there's a couple of examples of fusion beats. Fusion beats on an EKG is anytime we have more than one electrical, uh, electrical event happening at the same time. <clears throat> uh, and it can be what we call isolated electrocardiographic or it can be what we call an actual fusion. Um, Isolated electrocardiographic means we have two independent things that happen that, that are happening simultaneously. They're their own isolated event, but they're happening uh, at the same time. So the most common thing for that to occur is that sometimes we will have the T, we'll have the repolarization of the QRS complex happening, so the T wave, uh, and the rhythm is going fast enough that the P wave starts to initiate. Um, early or not early, but before the T wave is done. The T wave is related to ventricular repolarization. 
the P wave is related to atrial depolarization. So those two events can happen simultaneously sometimes. And what we'll see on the EKG is a combination of both the T wave and the P wave. And this is called an isolated electrocardiographic fusion. Two independent things that happen to happen at the same time. And on the EKG, we have a wave that, that, that shows characteristics of both of those events happening. Versus an actual fusion, an actual fusion is where we had one event occurring and another event occurring and somewhere the electrical activity hit in the middle and dissipated or, or showed a new event. So our fusion wave is actually a wave that shows both of these events coming together in some fashion. They aren't two isolated events that happen to happen on top of each other. They instead are two events that hit each other and create a whole new waveform. And so that's called an actual fusion of the wave. Okay, so that's a lot. That's the start of our view of how to analyze an EKG. It'll become easy or easier as we move along. Uh, approach every single EKG one step at a time. Eliminate the crap, check out the rhythm, look at the rate, establish the P waves, look at the QRS complexes, and then we will identify the crap and put it back in there. That'll start to make sense as we start to analyze things and as we start to look at different rhythm strips. Um, once you have some rhythm strips to look at, we'll set up some times where uh, we can zoom or some times in lab where we can work on it together. Uh, and we can walk through some of these strips one step at a time. Uh, don't get too frustrated at the moment or think that you're uh, not doing well. Everything's gonna be fine when we start to look at things, but make sure you're approaching these in a very systematic way. Okay, that's where we'll stop for this video segment. The next video segment is we'll start to look at some sinus rhythms.